Hey guys, welcome back to the Revive Strong Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Joe Jeffrey on the podcast. Uh, you may be hearing this name for the first time, but it won't be the last time because I assure you, you're going to want to learn more about Joe, and you're going to really enjoy this episode where we dig into some of his training philosophies, how those have changed over time, and also talk about the enhanced realm a little bit and how you can educate yourself more and more about that if you are wanting to go down that side. And guys, if you haven't yet, please head over to Spotify, and if you're listening to Spotify, please do rate us out of five give us a five out of five star rating that'll really help us over on spotify uh, even if you haven't got the app please you can download it in a matter of seconds and give us a rating we'd highly appreciate it but without further ado let's get into the podcast hi guys welcome to the revive stronger podcast i'm your host as always steve hall and today i have joe jeffrey on the podcast some of you may have heard this name actually cropping up. I think it's cropped up a few times on the podcast when I've had Mike Isretel on because Joe's been giving him a little bit of help here and there. Joe is the founder of the Physique Collective. You may have seen them on Instagram or various podcasts, actually. Um, they have a couple there going about the place. And Joe himself is a bodybuilding coach and an educator. They have the Physique Collective app, which is about bodybuilding education, which is really cool. And like a, a bunch of entertainment stuff over there as well. But that's about the most I know about Joe, actually. And I've been following him actually for ages, uh, but kind of more closely over the last few months and kind of really enjoying the content that they're putting out and listening to some of these podcasts. And I, I definitely wanted to get him on to share more about what he's doing over at the Physique Collective and to get a bit of background behind Joe. So I don't know if there's anything else you'd like the listeners to know about you, Joe. Uh, obviously, you're very passionate about your dogs as well. We just <laughs> discovered off air. Yeah, we could do a dog podcast. No, um, <laughs> yeah, Steve, thank you for having me, man. Um, I've actually listened to this podcast for a long time on and off. You know, oh, many, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. In terms of things that you haven't mentioned about me, there's probably not a lot. That It, it is that simple. Um, I'm an online physique coach, primarily competitors. I'd like to say somewhat people searching for optimality. I mostly work with people either going for pro cards or with pro cards or at least aspiration to compete on a high level, male and female in, in all classes. Um, I've done it for quite a long time, full-time coaching around about six years, but coaching a little bit longer than that um, on the side. Um, and the Physique Collective is the newest endeavor. We're, we're just about coming up to our one year birthday and i'm really proud of the work that we've done thus far by the way anybody listening if i sound like i'm underwater at this point we're having some renovations done on our house and i'm going to try my best to work around the noise in the background steve you can let me know if it gets too bad and i will go and tell them to be quiet but yeah within the physique collective we do have the app now that's a relatively new launch and we, we just wanted to make the educational side of things more easily accessible. It started mostly as me doing pharmacology education, um, which is where I've worked with some people that you know, like Dr. Mike and Jared, and I work with some of Jared's clients, like I co-coach some people with Jared where I'll handle the nutrition and pharmacology and Jared will handle the training, which is always awesome to work with those guys. Um, and then I brought on other people were doing physique collective to handle some of the other facets of physique development, like your mindset stuff, nutrition stuff, your over the counter supplementation stuff, lifestyle, whatever it may be. And um, I'm really proud of the community that we've built in there. It, it feels really like something special. It's super open, very friendly. And that has been the feedback that we've had, which I'm so proud of because I wanted to create a bodybuilding forum that was friendly i think a lot of these like um especially when it comes to performance enhancing drug realm forums can be quite standoffish um but i, th I think we've really done great work we've created a, a friendly open community so i'm really happy with that but yeah i won't drivel on about myself too much that's me in a nutshell online coach mostly specializing in the realm of pharmacology education outside of my own coaching and we have the physique collective app it's really cool to hear about it, actually, because I think you got into and having looked at like your website and some of your coaching, we got into coaching online at a similar time. 
uh, and our coaching methods in terms of like you like your check like you do some check-in videos and things like this and you obviously develop the member site and we we went down that route a little bit as well so it's kind of cool to see like you guys doing it that way too and uh, I mean the podcast just shows itself how many different facets come into bodybuilding like it's it's a lifestyle it truly is so so many things impact it so it's really cool that you've got like experts in there that can help with people and yeah forums are kind of where it all started in some ways for us at least when i first got into it, it was probably the same for you joe where it was just like it was all forums like facebook and things it wasn't where it was happening certainly not instagram uh, and not really that much on YouTube. It was kind of growing. There was quite a cool YouTube fitness scene when I was first getting into things, actually. That was like Matt Ogus and Ian McCarthy. They were some of the more yes. evidence-based people at the start. Uh, how did you get into like into where you are now? What drove you that direction? Like, How did you become such an expert on like pharmacology? What you led you to bodybuilding? I'm, re- I'm interested to hear about that as well. Uh, I think the, the expert in, in pharmacology, I don't want to be a self-proclaimed expert, but I think my... um. My passion for the pharmacology side of bodybuilding was a lack of information being readily available to me back then. I think we're, we're, we've actually done a bit of a, a 180 now where there's almost too much information. Uh, the, the majority of it, sadly, not the best when it comes to the performance enhancing drug realm. Um, but for me, when I first started, like you said, it was like bodybuilding.com forum. And um, then some of those Facebook groups and things like that. And I remember watching guys like Matt Ogus and, and Ian McCarthy, Jason Genova. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> mentioned on, a, on YouTube. So, yeah, for me, it was just a, a lack of information that then over time became the only word I could use would be an obsession with learning more. The more I learned, the more I realized how much more there was to learn. And then I started, I realized the, the way that I learned the best was by putting out content on a subject that I knew nothing about. So I would do, for example, uh, a drug like metformin. I would want to learn about, so I would read various meta-analyses and and systematic reviews, and I would make notes and reference this study and cite that article and stuff and put it into a presentation. And then I'd maybe, like we would do a check-in screencast, a lecture to it. And um, I would just put that out, which is, kind of how physically it started i just like started throwing these lectures out um and that that's the I, I never really set out to be an educator more so than selfishly i wanted to educate myself on how to use the drugs in a safer more effective and efficient manner but that method of learning was a vehicle to becoming an educator which i'm glad that i did now um and I, I just uh, kind of randomly discovered this passion because I decided to use steroids and couldn't really find a great evidence-based um, format to do so under because I was into natural bodybuilding beforehand, very much into people like Lane Norton. And I just caught the beginning of that wave. You'll know what I mean by this, Steve, when that evidence-based thing started, yeah. you know, right back then. And, and that really spoke to me. But there wasn't the PED side of it, which left me frustrated so i tried to pick that up myself and then you know here we are many years later and i'm still doing the the same thing that's really cool and i think i can definitely speak to the same like when i used to write articles and i actually missed that element of like it made you you can almost learn new things well you'd learn when you did it because it would force you especially if you're trying to do it in an evidence space where you're not just like making stuff up but it takes a lot of time and effort so i can see why when you get to a certain point you do want to try and monetize that or because it takes so much time you're not going to invest that time unless there's some payback there as well and you can guarantee it's of a high quality and high standard so i love that there's people out there like yourself who are like it was broderick chavez as well he's been on the podcast several times he's got his member site as well like spreading good kind of education to this route because everyone's like a, a natural bodybuilder before they go down that route so maybe they're listening to this and they're thinking about it and we can kind of save them from going uh, down a place like you said there's a lot of misinformation and bad information out there and we can direct them and you can really help them so that's that's damn cool um and I, something i wanted to talk about is kind of your programming and training programming background and kind of where that started and how it's kind of morphed or changed over time and where you are now with it because um at least i like you see me i'm in the bodybuilding scene and i see like i'm very much trying to be down the kind of evidence-based route and i like using certain methods and principles but 
there's some people that kind of really like to say that's not the way to go and it's not kind mm-hmm. of the, the kind of bodybuilding approach and stuff and I've seen just the industry change over time so I'd love to hear about how that's changed for you. Yeah so I, I did a podcast a while ago with John Jewett and Cuba and Luke um no switch fitness where we got into a little bit of this discussion so i'll elucidate my thoughts on this so where we live in in england there's a religion of low volume high intensity training that people um ha- have a very strong and the reason i use religion is and the, interestingly i i approached someone on physique collective there was this uh research paper about religious individuals or, or people not necessarily religion there was various cohorts but it was people with firmly held beliefs and when presented with evidence to support the contrary interest in brain activity that was almost defensive against accepting the the new um idea which i think is a sin if you are a coach or a bodybuilder interested in learning something that we need to be really careful of and something that i had to call myself on a while ago uh, which is the reason why I, I, I kind of say this because it was very easy for me to fall into what I th- I thought was emotionally interesting, you know, because we all love to train with all out intensity. And, you know, you've got the video of uh, JP, there's nothing on JP. I love JP. I think he's an incredible athlete. Um, and I think the way that he trains is actually perfectly suitable for him. Um, you know, taking a set of RDLs to all out failure and say, yes, I want to go and do this. You know, it's really exciting. In reality, if you're searching for uh, optimal hypertrophy outcomes, it's probably not the, the best choice always to do this. And uh, there'll be relevant trade offs with the amount of volume that you can train with or the frequency or the net stimulus as compared to the amount of fatigue, especially with my clients. A lot of people don't think. This applies to higher level people, you know, that, that they need to train like that in reality. But with my clients, I have to be very, very careful of things like stimulus to fatigue ratios. If you have an individual that can RDL um, four plates aside for 15 reps, you know, and what, what's that going to do to the autonomic nervous system as compared to the work done through the hip extensors? You compare that to maybe putting them on a the Cybex VR2 hip extension machine where you're locked in, you've got the belt on, the cam matches the strength profile of the hip extensor perfectly. The stability is excellent. You know, you can get a lot more local stimulus to the hip extensors that way with much less nervous system fatigue. I'm quite far off the point here, but <laughs> the point being is that I started training basically through I used to be on a forum called Intense Muscle years ago. Um, don't know if many people will know what this is. And um, there was Jordan was on there. Dr. Scott Stevenson was on there, who I'll shout out as one of the most intelligent and inspirational people to me as a mentor coming up in this industry. Skip Hill was on there. And we all trained DC training. You know, dog crap training is just what you did. You know, everyone there did that. And um didn't really work for me. You know, because I didn't have a great genetic proclivity to be strong and my tension based overload was always pretty poor. And um, I didn't really get great results. And I thought, you know, my genetics must just be pretty terrible. Um, I don't think I have incredible genetics. I don't think they're that poor either. They're probably just about average. Um, Eventually, I had to come to terms with my own likeness for learning and the more i learned about hypertrophy based research the more it disagreed with my emotional connection to training in a certain way and i had to slowly drift away and then i actually saw much better results <laughs> and then my clients exactly the same and i was like okay <laughs> i need to take a check on my own emotional bias here and you know now i'm pretty much all the way over at the side of evidence-based training uh, i wouldn't even say pretty much just you know totally and that's how me and Jared got friendly. Actually, I got Jared to do some training programming for me. Um, and then we were voice noting back and forth. This was at the end of his prep about some pharmacology related stuff for his prep. And we became friends from there. But that's that's how the evolution, I think, for most people goes, at least um, with where we're from. You're seeing a lot more of this now, even amongst coaches that were more sort of um, 
known for that. In fact, like I'm, I'm very close friends with Cal Rainstreet, one of the muscle mentors. And this is someone also, you know, that like me, we've gone through this and, and, and he has gone through this himself and has ended up moving away slightly to having a more periodized approach with using reps in reserve and, you know, inc maybe incrementally moving up volume over each mesocycle, et cetera. Um, and that's how I landed here today, I think. Yeah, I think uh, that's, I'd been following you for a while and then I saw, I think, I don't know where I saw it, but I saw there was something between you and Jared and I was like, it just sprung a like, whenever I see people who are, I'm obviously good friends with Jared and Mike. And so whenever I see them col collaborating with other people, I know I'm like, oh, like what's happening here? This is cool. So that made me really start like following you and you guys more closely. And then I was like, oh, wow, like actually this is, this kind of the evidence-based style of training that you get a little bit of a hard time. You get some pushback for uh, is starting to kind of go a bit further, which was really cool to see. For me, a great analogy is <clears throat> for me, it was nutrition. I was very much like clean eating. I, I can't have these certain bad foods. They're fattening. And then learning about flexible dieting. And I hated it at first. So that kind of response you talked about in that paper, I, like I felt that where I'm just like, no, 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 this can't be right. I can't eat like, I don't know white rice and see the same results as if I'm having like a, a white potato or what have you. It's just like that just didn't jive for me or even better results potentially for adherence or maybe there's certain times where certain unclean foods could provide a better nutritional time or response to other foods. Whereas it's the same with the training aspects, I guess there's, there's still a little bit of that, like you said, of religion, almost a little bit of a dogma. And I guess if someone's seeing results, it's hard to then move to something else, especially if it's to your preferences and you enjoy it. And I guess like you, you, you kind of, well, like I'm not seeing the results that I would like or expect. And it's clear you have a very kind of thought out in it, like you like learning. So you kind of sort that next level. Um, with your clients, did you, did you see any challenges to that? Are there, there some people you've had to modify things to kind of suit their particular preferences? Or have you found that people have been pretty open-minded to it? Yeah, somewhat. I I've got some clients that, that definitely have some like emotional connections to some exercises, which I, I think is fine because there's an enjoyment element there. Like Nate Heckles, for example. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen Nate. I've Heckle. probably seen him. Huge dude, extremely strong. Um, loves to deadlift from the floor. You know, all of this stuff. He trains with James Hollinshead. So, you know, a lot of that stuff. So we just have to work in a little bit more delicate volume landmarks with a little bit more precise reps and reserve use to manage fatigue. I think if I could just put like a big highlight around the word fatigue when it comes to most of my clients is, is what we're trying to control the most when you consider the musculature a lot of these men and, and women have, the amount of training volume that they need to do even to just be minimally effective the amount of drugs that they need to take, the amount of food that they need to eat, um, all of these things to be minimally effective within the context of the autonomic nervous system that doesn't grow like your skeletal or muscular uh, system does. You know, it is very much a labile system. You need to be very careful with how and when you drive that fatigue. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I've had to do. Also. I've had some uh, pushback with some clients training with reps and reserve. Um, but it's always a just trust me. And to this day, not one has ever gone back. Um, I feel like the biggest success story of the year for me probably was Joe Ballinger. Started yeah. um, working with him again, like a big circle around the word fatigue. Um pulling down his drug load substantially, pulling him very far away from failure because he's just like a ball of injuries, you know, as every issue, spine, knees, whatever, you know, Joe's got it. Um, but we're so close to a pro card and his improvements over a relatively short off season have been phenomenal. Um, all with just managing fatigue uh, in training mostly, you know, I think, I think training has been the biggest contributing factor to Joe's progress. It's definitely not drugs because he's taken a lot less than ever before. Um, it's definitely not food because we had to stay within a pretty close proximity to stage condition because we're going back in um, for another pro card attempt uh, April. So training is the only variable that's been really 
really uh, different. And as you know, the the results speak for themselves. He looks like a completely different athlete this coming season. I think it it speaks a lot to you as a a coach and as an individual for people to trust you with it because I think. I don't know, as a bodybuilder, it probably is training is your most, like, that's the thing you attach most of your emotion to. And that's, I don't know, for a lot of us, it is part of our, who we are. Uh, we are that person that, I don't know, does deadlifts and goes all out and like crushes themselves. And even if I have to get injured, I'm doing this damn thing. And it's just, I don't know, it's part of an emotional attachment. So for you to be able to kind of manage that a little bit better and kind of drive that focus in the right areas that speaks a lot to you as, yeah, I mean, the ability to communicate it as well in that, like, you, you're you not just saying do this because this is the right way to do it. It's a case of this is why um, and this is how we're going to do it and this is what's going to drive the best results. And I always use the analogy of, I don't know, when you, <clears throat> as you get more and more educated as an individual, you specialize more and more. Um, you can't focus on, actually, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is the right analogy. <laughs> oh, that, no, it is. I think you can't spread yourself over as many wide things. So specificity goes up but also just like every little cost of everything costs more. So every bit of time and energy and focus needs to be more specific and I guess uh, more driven towards the goal and outcome. So exercise selection, I think is one that's is the kind of the new almost wave that's coming in with the kind of biomechanics and the focus there. And I can see how that's getting some pushback, but it, it's also people are starting to weave some of that into their programming as well. And this is, this is the beauty I think of, doing these podcasts and the education is bringing everyone together because you need elements of everything. And that's, that's what's further in the field. Do you work with just enhanced people or are you working with some naturals as well? And do you see any differences? Cause a lot of people think there's like stark differences in how you would approach programming for someone natural and advanced. And I think you'd probably be a great person to ask. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I, do, I do still have a handful of natural clients, but for the most part, most of them are moving enhanced like there'll be a, a pretty good natural competitor that is planning to go forward into the enhanced realm um the programming is exactly the same it's exactly the same i mean all of my programming is built primarily on auto regulation through a mesocycle anyway um and the biological inter individuality of volume effort frequency is is so widespread the, the only commonality is going to be that the drugs will probably allow you to perform a little bit more recoverable volume, but that's within the context of the single individual. Um, the, the programming in and of itself, how we would allocate volume and, and why specific to the individual is relevant only to that and, and not to the drug input. Um, but the addition of drugs obviously make everything just work a bit better. Yeah, it's like the principles don't suddenly change. <laughs> like the principles for growth don't suddenly change. You've just, it's like having a surplus versus not, or being in a deficit, your recoverable volume changes for that yeah. individual. But the myth is like um, <clears throat> this, because I saw it on Reddit the other day, was like when you go in hearts, you, you should do a bro split. And I can't see the, the evidence. It seems bizarre that like the rules of frequency would suddenly change. I can only imagine one of my clients trying to do like all of their volume in a single session. <laughs> it would just be of such poor quality. It makes, yeah. So, And then with your programming, I guess, including that's like deload periods, were you taking the, were you kind of using those previously or has your approach to how you like to deload changed? Does it change individual to individual? Um, I think my approach to deload has always, I've always liked to follow some kind of taper into a deload. And I learned that from Dr. Scott Stevenson's fortitude training book. I did fortitude training for years, actually, after, after DC training. Um, so I, I tend to do pretty much exactly what Mike and Jared would recommend, you know, the RP crew, there'd be some kind of taper of volume and or effort and or load through the week to eventually something pretty minimal. But I, I would always prefer that over not going to the gym at all. I think on paper, the difference is going to be fairly minimal, but in my experience, neurologically, with individuals taking a full week out of the gym and then coming back to those same movement patterns, struggle um, internally to work the same way. So if it's not too much of a hassle, I'd rather a client keep going to the gym, but maybe for the first half of the week, you know, we would 
perform half the amount of sets that we would have done at the final week of the mesocycle and half the amount of reps and then I'll follow that up with a load reduction later in the week. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I, I think the days off again come more from the crowd of the kind of go hard or go home type of deal. So it's a case of if I can't go hard or go home, I'm just staying at home uh, because I can't just go to the gym and do like, I don't know, a light workout. Whereas I think once you're kind of brought into a more evidence-based kind of tapering up volume, tapering up intensities, working through MEV to MRV potentially, you kind of are more happy with just doing what you think is probably providing the result you want. And I've seen, I particularly like, if I take that many days off coming into week one, it feels very foreign. And I, that's the anecdote I hear all the time is why am I so weak or feel like this, like a week after my dealer It's like, well, what did you do in your dealer? I took a week off. So everything yeah. feels a bit, they feel a bit lost. <laughs> I think, uh, especially in, in England, we have a, um, a community of chronic undertraining. You know, people take, I just need uh, four days off, or five days, I'm going to take five days off, I'm going to do a, uh, a D volume week where I'm still going to take everything, you know, to failure, just do less volume. In reality, if your goal is to drive maximum hypertrophy, it's probably a good idea to get to the point of functional overreaching. And believe me, you're not overreached if you need five days off, you know, or you need to de-volume for a week like you will want to take the full week off like you will not want to train if you've really gone there um and that says a lot to me i think or just not deloading at all you know i it's that old i ought to regulate my deloads when was your last deload <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you you probably could be doing a lot more i think this happens to me quite often when obviously when I, I coach myself so I do take myself through the kind of only landmarks and I get there and I'm like I see some people training for I don't know the similar level of advancement to me maybe they've gone like they said they haven't gone like 10 weeks without a deload and I'm in my like fourth and fifth week of training I'm like oh yeah I reckon I can push another week and then I get there and I'm like fuck me I'm done yeah. <laughs> like I've got nothing left even if I was to try and push a set to failure because you if you have gone through MRV like your performance is so shot it'll just be demoralizing uh, and just wouldn't feel productive at all. So you're almost like forced, like you you earn that deload. You're kind of forcing yourself to do it. I think your point there in terms of kind of people under training, uh, I don't know if you've had this with clients, but certainly when I took them, like it's kind of a case of trust me, by the week before deload, you probably have done one of the hardest weeks of training you've ever done in your life if if you follow things correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I had this with uh, Dan Bastig fairly recently. He was like, I'd written up a four-week uh, mesocycle that we kind of water regulated up. He was like, no, I can go again next week. I'm like, Dan, you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, just give me some additional volume, you know, sauna, smells, cool. I was like, okay, and I'll put it all in there. And then I think it's taken him like four weeks to get back to normal. He's like, I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do that again. It was completely unproductive. It was like, we've had to take this much time just to get back to square one. Like, right, next time, let's just, uh, I'm glad that you've learned that early on. So, uh, because again, it's that more, 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 more mentality. Even when I think when you move over to this evidence-based style of training, you need to be aware that it is not just about emptying more out. It's about being maximally stimulative when the time is right and deloading specifically for super compensation when the time is right, you know? Yeah. And do you find uh, you're using a lot of specialization mesocycles with your guys because they're much more advanced and that you're finding that it's almost a necessity to keep progress going. Yes, pretty much 90, 95% of my training programming is all specialization to some degree, or at least carry some heavy dominance. Yeah, uh, very, very few clients do I have on some kind of systemic MEV to MRV. In, unless we're in like a fat loss phase, then, then I'd be more inclined to, to lean towards that. But yeah, all of my clients, we have specifics that we're improving on between shows to bring the right balance or the requirements for the category and, and it's less so about systemic growth for the most part yeah and does that typically look i don't know you might hold 
the rest of your body at maybe MEV or MV, um, like nice low volume static and then pushing the others and maybe change your frequency there? Yeah, it's going to depend on, on the client. So if I, I, I keep throwing out these names, for example, so like Brian Ward, for example, he had this double knee surgery last, uh, sorry, year before last. And then we had him, he was in the heavyweights. I think he got third at two rows after a year back. But legs are still very imbalanced, right? But he's not a million miles away from the weight cap. So for the past year, we're literally moving back into prep um, in about four weeks' time. For the past year, we've kept the upper body all at maintenance volume. I'm talking four to eight sets per week. Um, and the lower body has been up to 30-plus sets. Wow. Per, yeah, and he's done a rinse and repeat. AM, PM, quad and ham training, crazy stuff. Um, but they're absolutely blown up. And now he's, he's, I think we need one more training cycle to be like there. Um, so that's one example of where I would keep that because we've got a relatively tight spot that we need to get back into. Um, funnily enough, he has added quite a good size on his upper body. I think, you know, the drugs work quite well. Maybe maintenance volume would be, maybe that did edge him a bit more towards minimum effective volume. But then other people, again, to use Joe as an example, he does still just need to get bigger as a super heavy, um, but we, we needed a lot more top line. It was all the judges feedback, more lateral, down, more sort of clavicular region of the pec. We needed to fill that all up, which we have done. So there was a lot of bias to volume across the delts, the pecs, the arms somewhat. And then everything else I kept, you know, kind of close to minimum effective volume, but we still had some escalation in there, just not as aggressive as the top line. Because of course there's a systemic amount of fatigue that we can deal with and how we allocate that is very important in competitors. Yeah. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And I think that's, that's where I personally fell in love with the kind of evidence-based style of training and using these principles in terms of like set progression and the volume landmarks, because it allowed me as a coach to actually be like a programmer rather than just be like, this is your split. <laughs> and it was a case of no, actually I can modify things week to week. We can auto regulate things. Uh, and we brought up auto regulation a few times and I'd be really interested to hear kind of what feedback you're looking for from your clients in terms of how then you make these maybe set changes or what have you week to week. Um, that'd be really cool to hear about. Yeah. So I, I think what a really good way for most people to do is to use the standard soreness pump. Um, in my clients, it's a pretty terrible way because they all lie to me. Because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, high level body was not yes yeah, sorry anyway no yeah pump was all right yeah. you know so i'm looking specifically at progression and the line of progression trends mostly um biofeedback as well and some autonomic markers like resting heart rate blood pressure sleep duration and quality they're things that matter to me if i have an objective marker of overreaching or if we're getting closer to it that the client can't lie to me about that's really useful um so i mean if performance is great and all of those biometrics are holding well and they're also saying yeah i didn't get sore and whatnot then i'll chunk up a bit of volume or decrease the proximity to failure based on that and to whatever degree of specificity we've got but also maybe you know if if they're not great i may push them further to overreach also proactively um but I think for most people, they should learn to get very honest and adept at managing things like their own biofeedback. In fact, I'll bring up Dr. Scott Stevenson again, something that he used in the Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach book, which if anybody doesn't own, buy it. It is like the bodybuilding Bible. It's incredible. Um, a um, perceived recovery scale. Yeah. Um, and I usually ask clients to kind of wake up in the morning address how they feel i'm kind of looking at a marker of autonomic nervous system function you know if over a, a course of a training exercise with that sympathetic tone expression like slowly ramps up to the point of your allostatic load just kind of spilling over and you being overreached as that attenuates which it generally does then i know how close they are to overreaching and once i've seen what those biometrics look like when they overreach they're pretty easily um, replicated in future mesocycles. Yeah, I, I, the reason I burst out laughing was because I have seen the same thing with a, some some of my clients can be honest, and I always ask them to be honest. But I have those clients that are just like, 
always fresh never like not even like okay readiness i get them to rate kind of fatigued okay or fresh and they're just everything's always fresh and like they, they never get sore anywhere and so i mean some muscle groups don't get sore and but i think some people yeah, i think actually even scott has done like various like studies on people where their perception of pain and things and pain tolerance is so That's wildly right. different and i think right. some bodybuilders and some of us are just like yeah more is better and like oh no nah, it's nothing like i can train through it what have you but like you mentioned i think that that's where you should start are those objective uh, markers as well. Uh, and actually something I found interesting, I know you've got an aura ring. Um, so yeah. I, I don't, I don't have any specific questions surrounding it particularly, but it's something I've always looked at as like, do I want to invest in that? Or should I not? like, part of me is just like the guy that, you know, just wants to invest in everything that could possibly help my bodybuilding. But I've spoken to um, Greg Potter, who you might've heard on the podcast. And he's always like, Steve, I don't think you need to go to that level. Like, I don't, I don't think that data is going to be um, p- potentially that beneficial to your sleep versus your Fitbit. But I, I, I'd love to hear your experience with your ring and whether that's something you recommend your clients. And because you may have a different perspective, for Greg, because he's all sleep. So, no, I, I probably agree with Greg. The only reason I bought an aura ring was because I got married, and um, <laughs> I, I just wear it on my wedding uh, finger. It, it, it seems a lot more efficient than wearing a fitbit so i never liked wearing something on my wrist now i'm not well read on the data in terms of accuracy i have heard complete conjecture the aura ring sleep um data is extremely accurate in fact i I will give one anecdote uh when i was a proper bodybuilder i had sleep apnea so i used to be about 260 pounds i only wear like 220 now hobby bodybuilder hobby builder um and I, when I had to go and get my sleep test done, they send you all the sort of data through, and I correlated it with my aura ring, and it matched to the T. Um, and this was a proper study with all the things on you, and you know, um, so I at least know that it's pretty accurate there. Um, but honestly, I haven't used it for anything other than steps <laughs> for, the, for the for the longest time, and I'm not a fan of HRV as a as a biometric. I think we're pretty far behind on that having real any utility for for bodybuilding outcomes i think uh you know it, it's handy to know your resting heart rate but your fitbit can do that sleep is like the, the thing is with sleep and bodybuilders like we're already at least my clients are already doing everything they can you know uh what's looking at it gonna tell me you know maybe some accountability if you're not but all of my all of my guys are sleeping properly because they're competitive you know we're, we're not it's not going to look at that and go right i need to go to bed at a different time we're already doing that so you know, I, I probably only buy one if you want a ring. I actually just bought the, the new Aura and gave my old one to my wife, who actually lost it yesterday, which is great. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't do anything that my other one didn't do. <laughs> so, you know, it's an expensive purchase to, to look at your steps. <laughs> well, I appreciate the honesty. And uh, I think you're, you're right in terms of, like, the studies and stuff. It's the most accurate, like reporting of sleep that we have so far and i know greg's gripe with it always is like it gives you this data but then it doesn't tell you how to use it <laughs> it just just spurts out to you and like you said uh, you're already hopefully doing all the sleep hygiene and everything you can to be promoting it uh so it's difficult to yeah rationalize uh, i was hoping you were going to sell me on it i was like going to make a purchase now like that maybe there's a, a boxing day sale still going on <laughs> but not that uh and then actually in, in that regard um in terms of data that you're collecting from your clients, what do you, because uh, I know you, you said you're, well, obviously sleep is something you're kind of looking to get information about. What else, what kind of things are you looking to pick up from your clients? I'm so given most of my guys are in hearts, we're looking at blood pressure is is a non-negotiable reading two or three times per month. You, no matter what degree that you are pushing your enhancement in bodybuilding, you should never, ever let your blood pressure get out of even a really respectable healthy range and there's no excuse to you know there's no there's no reason why we we have incredible um drugs that are indicated specifically for blood pressure attenuation namely angiotensin receptor blockers that every single anabolic androgenic steroid users should just be using by proxy this is something that i've helped mike with this year um uh, th- there's no reason why you wouldn't want to block angiotensin to as an androgen user, you know, with these at our disposal, very safe, lots of data on lifelong deployment at 
dosages far above and beyond what we would ever require. There's no, why, why should our blood pressure ever escalate that? That's a real, you know, they call it the silent killer for a reason. So mm. that's one blood glucose, uh, you know, sometimes, but uh, my, my gripe with blood glucose as a marker of insulin sensitivity is very much half of the picture. I'd need to also look at fasted blood insulin and then create some homeostatic model of assessment of insulin resistance with the two. Um, I like to look at it as a trend, sometimes as a stress marker um or trends maybe to indicate insulin resistance over extended periods of time but it's not something that i'm that interested in um maybe less frequent biomarkers would be blood work so all of my clients every three months we're going and getting comprehensive panels done um lipids kidney markers liver markers maybe hormones we're looking to specifically optimize um maybe the thyroidal axes and where we're going to put our thyroid medication or, or whatever it may be. Um, urinalysis is something that I'm pretty heavy on for kidney markers that are accurate. The issue that you come under with enhanced guys that are very musculature is they have these skews in blood work that make some of the markers inaccurate. Like for example, if you're very muscular, you're going to have a very high creatinine and the EGFR estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is our sort of primary marker of kidney function. That is a calculation of lots of boring stuff, but it includes creatinine. And we can see an attenuation in EGFR if you have high creatinine. It doesn't necessarily mean that your kidneys aren't functioning properly. It could just mean you're very muscular. So go on and get in a cystatin C or a urinalysis for microalbuminuria is, is very important. On top of that, an echocardiogram specifically, at least annually. This is the only real accurate marker of cardiovascular disease risk in androgen users because you have skews on so many things like lipids hdl attenuation for example like we know that androgens mediate a decrease in hdl we don't know what that does to the efflux capacity of the cholesterol so you need to look at what degree of ventricular hypertrophy you're driving over these specific periods of time what your androgen use was in that time determine the trend line you know things like that so it's, it gets a little bit more tricky when you're in hearts but it should be you know that, that um responsibility comes with the drug use as you were saying it i was like man as naturals we have such an easy time it's like body weight get some photos now and then <laughs> like how is your sleep how are your energy levels stuff like this um almost just like talking through how you're feeling like we don't need all this like necessarily as often the objective data of the numbers because as long as we're doing a lot of what <clears throat> the enhanced guys are also doing but we're not putting anything on top of that and stressing our body in in additional ways uh so yeah it's we have a much easier time but it's it's really cool to hear about someone at your level and you're helping pros or people who want to become pro and they're doing all of this due diligence which is fantastic because that's going to keep people in the sport for longer and healthier and that's that's how it should be mm. i mean unfortunately the guys at the pro ranks are dealing with unsustainable drug use very high risk models there's not a way around that right um there's a way around the asinine you know five six seven eight gram usage which is crazy which still happens um but you know it's going to be very hard to turn pro on you know dosages less than a gram averages are probably sitting two to three gram a week which is not sustainable at all and, and it's going to take time off of your life so um it's very important to be on top of that stuff i guess that's a discussion you have with your athletes when you're consulting with them it's just not a case of like do this it's a case of these are the risks and rewards what's your tolerance it, yeah it's a very hard um ethical position to be in as a coach so you have to have that discussion like if we're planning out periodization which is a, another whole topic a, a periodization is probably the most missed thing in drug use um so maybe we're planning out a macro cycle and just like we have these rotation of mesocycles and dietary structures we, we also have a or, or i at least have a scheme of pd uh, escalation that will occur we work out things like the androgen load average for the average exposure and you have to say to the client okay well when we're at the peak load where do you you know where does your risk to reward fall and then on top of that you have the huge degree of biological into individuality so like is that peak load actually going to do much you know one person's 200 milligram is another person's 2000 milligram both in terms of the like mitrophic effects like 
the muscle growth that you can see, but also the, the negative health consequences. There's such a degree of complication in it and nuance, um, which is why, I mean, most of my clients I have for years and years and years with quite a smallish client base as compared to a lot of coaches because it takes that time and like you said diligence to get all of these schemas down for the individual i think that's i think that's great and it speaks a lot to you again that you have good client retention because i imagine particularly in the enhanced side it could be even worse than like on the the natural side where people jump in between coaches because they're i don't know they're expecting that short-term response or they they want to be pushed in some way or what have you um I forget that I uh that's the thing I had in mind. So something I see maybe more on the enhanced side, but I see it sometimes on the natural side is um weekly photos. So I I just saw people check in with their photos very frequently and I was always wondering kind of what like as a natural, why would you do it as a maybe you have some reasons why you might do it as a natural. I was just like, what are we gonna see in a week? I mean, especially not in a fat loss diet. What are we gonna see in a week? Like, fuck all. Uh and so I then learned, I can't remember who I was talking to. It might have been Mike, and he was like, like the scale as a enhanced individual is not very telling. And so actually photos are more valuable and that's something that you might collect on a weekly basis. So I don't know if that is kind of, if you think natural people should worry about weekly photos in like, especially in an off season improvement phase or, and if that is why and how valuable the scale is for enhanced guys. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think if I had a natural client, I'd probably say, just send me the pictures once a month and <laughs> let's look at the, the body weight. Uh, in enhanced guys, yes, yeah, completely different. I'll give you an example. Have you seen Leon Pierce, the classic goat on Instagram? Yes, so I think I have. He was a first timer this year, um, classic bodybuilder, and he started prep at 93 kilos. And he finished prep at 93 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I'm looking at the scale, I'd be going, oh my God, what's going on? But, you know, that's not saying he'd get in shape. You know, he won. He got first place. He, he won the show. So um, uh, his first show and, and looked unbelievable. So he was like linearly losing fat and gaining muscle here, which I don't want anybody listening to this to try because it's probably not going to happen. Leon is one of those genetic species that are one in seven billion you know he he is something else his shape his structure his response to every input is insane so you know when we had this escalation scheme of drugs throughout the prep you know maybe each week we'd add maybe 50 milligrams of androgens starting all the way you know whatever his trt dose would be and that's an anabolic input that drives anabolism regardless of many of the other sort of prerequisites that, that a natural would have this androgen is binding at the androgen receptor and transcribing muscle protein synthesis and turning on mTOR and all of the cool stuff that you need food for or training for. You know, so we're, we're simultaneously driving this calorie deficit. And we've got periods in the day where we're using drugs like growth hormone, clenbuterol, uh, yohimbine, injectable L-carnitine, whatever. So in periods of the day, we're, we're mobilizing and oxidizing a, a load of free fatty acids. And then in other periods of the day, we're eating food and we're training and you know blood insulin is very high and we've got all these androgens and now we're gaining muscle because the flux with the drug input that pharmacological input is so large you know the deficits are huge deficits and the surplus are huge surplus so in that case pitch you know every week i'm looking and i'm going man it looks like you've lost like two pounds of fat <laughs> i gained two pounds of muscle like it's, it's really obvious but the scale you out of been like oh my god we're not going to get in shape you're cheating on your diet or whatever it may be you know hi guys steve here just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service at revive stronger we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level if you're interested check the description and sign up yeah for sure yeah it's uh I, I maybe as a natural is the few times I like that frequency of photos is like nearing the end of like a fat loss diet or contest prep or photo shoot what have you where the scale it, like you are trying to lose such small amounts maybe the scale isn't playing ball but yeah like you said we're not we're certainly not starting a contest prep at like I don't know 90 kilos and, and ending on stage 90 kilos is never ever going to happen and if it is 
like some testing is very awful <laughs> for that federation. Um, something I also appreciate from you, Joe, is you don't, I mean, obviously you coach a lot of enhanced guys, you know exactly what you're doing on that front, but you don't kind of, like you said, you optimize things. So you're looking at everything. And I think you've been using kind of weighted apparel and weighted vests for actually a while. I actually only used it this contest prep and I've only used it maybe a year before that one client. But I think you may have even been applying them before, like James Krieger did his research review and things. And um, I love that that's the case. And I love to hear like your experience with it. Right. So this is something that I've been doing for a long time. I think the first time, so I'm not sure when James first used it, because you guys are the first people that I heard about it, because Holly Davidge sent me a link to your podcast saying, check this out. And I was like, oh, that's cool that it's kind of, uh catching on other people are, are doing this i remember really well it was because i was prepping for a show right before the first lockdown and i was maybe three weeks out or so and i was using the weighted vest and i had done for that prep and that was quite a long prep like 16 week prep that was the first time so a little, a little while ago now um i was using it because as you know i have dogs and my time especially at the time was very limited so I was just searching for ways to make my expenditure have a greater caloric cost whilst avoiding that metabolic adaptation element of losing weight. So I did actually exactly as James went on to describe was every time I lost a kilo, I put a kilo in the vest. So I, all, I remember I always weighed 265 pounds when I was walking. Um, and what I didn't do, which I think is a great idea, and, and I uh, appreciate the, the gravitas stat research could maybe translate over to humans potentially um even if not you know just carrying around more homeostatic weight is certainly going to contribute to more thermogenic output it, it is the wearing it through the day and, and whatnot i think that's a great idea and it's something that i've had great utility with small female competitors for example you know the higher energy flux yeah i create with these individuals the better and it's a it's a very easy time efficient low fatigue way to do so that and the standing desk have been two things that have revolutionized prep for a lot of my clients i shared a paper on physique collective recently where they were comparing these um changing the homeostatic activity of these two women i think they're around about 150 pounds one was standing for six hours and one was sitting and there was like a 600 calorie difference which is you know, wow which, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to dig up that paper. It's not physique related for anyone listening. Shameless plug. Um, did a little video of it. I mean, stood with my standing desk. And uh, yeah, it's huge utility for standing desk. And hey, stand at the desk with a weight invest on. And now you're really burning some calories. <laughs> so that's why I have the, this is a standing desk. And I had the, I went up to a 10 kilo vest. Uh, and I think I'm maybe getting just like some PTSD from having worn it for so freaking long. It was such a nice feeling to take it off. Um, and I think for me, I, I think I just need to find a sweet spot where I just found there was a point where I was just dreading it so much and it was making me drag even more than not. And I don't know, it, has it all been positive or have you had some negative experiences? I find that with individuals when it's the, the wearing it for a long time. Yeah. I have found much better client um, enjoyment with the weighted vest using a heavier weight for just activity. Like the 20 kilo, that. just an hour walk. So, you know, if you go out with your dog with the 20 kilo vest, and I promise you, you'll get some calf hypertrophy as well. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wonder, because I've been looking at my calves recently, I was like, they, they look bigger. And I don't know if it's actually, maybe they've, I wish I'd measured really. I don't know if I would have even seen a, enough of a significant change in measurement. I wonder if it was the weighted vest or if my off season grew them and I just lost fat and so they're looking bigger. It might actually be the weighted vest because I was wearing it. I was wearing it for 10 hours of my day doing like, I mean, 15 to 20,000 steps with it on. So yeah, it's a significant amount, but yeah, I think you're right in terms of potentially using it and like using it for activity. And you know, it's that short period of time, like you're in and out kind of like a weight training session versus just that constant stress throughout the entire day. And uh, it's probably some people like it one way versus the other, but it's cool to know that you'd also been thinking down that line. Like it's out of the box thinking. I'd only thought of it because I saw James was using it with his clients. So it's really cool that you're already thinking down that line of like, how can we mitigate 
kind of some of these like metabolic adaptations and this down regulation, especially for smaller individuals where sometimes their food just gets to horrendous levels. That I can't even imagine how they <laughs> can go through the day. Yeah. Yeah. With, with my smaller females, it's been, it's been incredible. And then, so yeah, I guess we're coming to an hour. Do I have time? Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you about, I wonder, hopefully it won't take another like half an hour to answer this question. But in terms of peak weeks, I noticed, uh, I think probably because I was only following you more closely recently, but some of the peaking protocols you were using were very similar to the new paper that was released from Scott Stevenson, yet they were also in his book. So that had been out for a time period. Had you been using that kind of approach previously where you had the, kind of the fat load and then the carb load? Um, or yes, was it so new and how was it? Peaking is something that I do a lot of. I um, I remember at the Two Bros British finals this year, I only had one client in it, but I peaked, I think, seven people. Oh, wow. Um, I do a lot of peaking through the competitive season. I pride myself on my ability to peak people. Um, so that structure was taught to me by Dr. Scott when I had mentoring with him. And that's got to be 10-ish 10, 10 years ago now. Um, uh, I, it, I don't peak people exactly the way that I think Scott outlines in that book. But if the, the premise of beginning with the quote-unquote fat load, which more so is the insulin-sensitizing slash fill up intramuscular triglyceride period, followed by the carbohydrate load, earlier in the week with a sufficient proximity to correct any spill um, and then using fluid and electrolyte manipulation prior to the show that structure I've always stuck with and then on a client to client basis the the amount of time that we'll fat load for or the amount of time that we'll have the carb load for or the amounts and the supplementation throughout and what we would do with drugs in this time etc is is very nuanced and I guess the way I'd looked at it and I was like I can, I can appreciate it because it's not too dissimilar to like some of the the backloading protocols that's like Eric Helms and uh, Cliff Wilson have talked about on the natural side. I think the the water manipulation, the diuresis, and that sort of protocol. I think that I, I might be speaking wrong for Scott, but I feel like that's more of an influence from the enhanced side, and I don't see it as something that's as big a change game changer for the naturals if they're in shape. If you're in shape, then probably don't do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say just like if you're not experienced with fluid and electrolyte manipulation, because unfortunately, like we like to work with evidence as best we can. Like it's a peaking somebody properly is an intuitive thing that takes experience. And it's, you know, as an evidence based practitioner, it's quite hard for me to describe the way that I like would peak people I because it's, you know, I've done so many times and you can see things that you can't necessarily describe it sounds so esoteric i apologize but it's um cliff says it, similar yeah it, it's hard to describe when you've peaked that many bodies especially large people um i think it's easier to peak muscular guys because you okay. can see it really clearly yeah you can see the rates of diuresis you know if i'm having a client send me a photo every two hours they're like yeah i've been for a p three times and i'm looking okay well you know and you can start to extrapolate and you can see where they land and stuff like that in in your head you can sort of forecast where they're going to be um i would actually say that that fluid and electrolyte manipulation was in the enhanced realm more novel and something that i really tried to push this year with the issues that we've had with um pharmaceutical diuretics this year specifically um likely the most dangerous drug that's used in bodybuilding but also the most not only unnecessary but actually like deleterious like i've never ever used a pharmaceutical diuretic and the main reason for this was as i was coming up through coaching ranks and watching the other coaches and having mentoring things with various coaches you know i'd watch people use pharmaceutical pharmaceutical diuretics and just look worse pretty much 9.9 .9 times out of 10 and i'm thinking this is not right surely like what's going on um so then i would mostly just do nothing in terms of fluid but then i got pretty good at driving diuresis in a manageable sense the problem with the pharmaceutical intervention is you can't change it it's happening at the rate that the drug is driving the end result with fluid and electrolyte manipulations i can adjust what i want to adjust 
alongside some drug interventions on top that, that don't drive diuresis. I'm also talking about squashing aldosterone or driving up estrogen and stuff like that. Then I can come up with a very predictable outcome, which is essential for peak week. The worst thing that enhanced guys do is prep for so long and then screw it up with some crazy like diazide and burger. This is the thing about people taking right. diazide burger and fries and they wake up looking terrible and it just like this is the way it's always been done so it makes absolutely no practical sense um so yeah is that something you helped mike with this time around because he was like looked much sharper this time yeah i think the main thing that i helped mike with was aldosterone control so uh and potentially estrogen management as well um namely not doing it um right i uh th- th- there's a bit of a so I don't want to be too verbose here, but there's a thing about squashing estrogen in the enhanced room. You know, you know, you have estrogen low as possible to be as dry as possible, but a little bit of a misunderstanding when people say that estrogen drives fluid retention. What they really mean is estrogen increases aldosterone, which increases fluid retention. Got you. Um, but estrogen also does a lot of cool stuff like increase glute 4 expression. And so, you know, your ability to drive glucose into the muscle cell is much higher with higher serum estrogen. You drop that, you're not going to be able to get as full as you can. The obvious answer is why can't we just turn down the aldosterone and keep the estrogen high? And we can. It just seems that nobody does. This. Um, so that's something that we did and uh, seems to work pretty well. That's awesome. Right, Joe, I'm going to, with that, we could dive into a whole peaking uh, podcast, I think, probably. And I might have to drag you back on to do that again. But thank you for, for taking the time to be here and talk through all of those things, I think. Uh, obviously an invaluable source of information for training nutrition, but also particularly if there's anyone listening who is on the enhanced side or thinking go down that route, I would love to direct them your way. Um, we're not really the podcast for talking like in depth on that, so, but it, I always like to bring people on who are on that side and doing it in a really smart way because no doubt people listening will want to go down that way anyway and kind of spread more evidence-based information down that route, I think is fantastic. So Joe, thank you for all the work you're doing and thank you for coming on. If people want to learn more, we spoke about, uh, yourself uh, where can they follow you um obviously the physique collective all of that where should they head yeah thank you for having me bro firstly absolute pleasure and anytime you want to do it again maybe i'll come on with mike and jared and we'll do round table or something that'd be cool oh, that'd be cool um yeah so to find me on instagram is joe underscore physique collective and if you want to check out physique collective you can go on physiquecollective.com it's only 6.99 a month we don't actually make any money on it. it's a passion project um or you can search for z collective on app store or play store we've got a big community forum on there loads of videos on enhancement and everything else you can imagine uh the, the moniker of physique collective is physique development simplified so all of the pd videos are 10 minutes or less they're annotated very clearly they're uh, broken down in easily understandable chunks, which was the big push to put the correct evidence and information in there, but to make it very readily understandable to the layperson. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, go and check out Physique Collective. Awesome. Fantastic. I'll make sure that's all linked below as well so you guys can find that quickly. And we'll catch you soon. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can you can log your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. 
we will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We cap them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.